Hi everyone, I'm Alyssa Palai, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the Playbook webinar. This is the final part of a four-part series, Lean Project Management and Visual Work Management, Eight Keys for Success in 2015. Our speakers today are myself, I'm the VP of Marketing at Playbook, Eric Graves, our VP of Product Development and Technology, and David Paulson, our CEO. In terms of agenda, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Playbook, the company, and then I'll hand over the webinar to Eric and David. Eric will be leading the discussion, and David will offer support. Today, Eric's going to cover the interactive format of the webinar, where we left off, left off in the last webinar. He's going to talk about learning management and learning earlier, including the architectural considerations involved in early learning and accommodating late learning, how Playbook supports these principles, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Um, and we'd also be really appreciative if you would answer one question regarding the value received from the webinar in the form of a one-question poll. So about Playbook. The solution was developed with a lot of effort over a long period of time, solving a complex problem, how to deliver high quality, quality innovative products faster. The methods we're going to discuss were developed from solving this problem. We worked with over, with several, over several years with over 60 companies, both large blue chip clients and smaller startups. This created a great environment for rapidly learning about what worked and what didn't in new product development. What all the companies had in common is they wanted to deliver market faster and deliver higher quality and more innovative products. However, all companies suffered the same problem, which is 90% of their products were late to market. So this is why we're here today to discuss some of these principles that combat these problems and improve product development success. So with that, I'll hand it over to Eric, Playbook's ex expert on making product development systems run faster. Thanks, Lisa. Hello again, everybody. Or, uh, welcome back to the people who were here before, and welcome to the new people. Uh, so we're going to do this one just like we did the last one, which is to say we're going to have it be semi-interactive. There are going to be two places uh, in the middle, and then one at the end where we're going to have an open mic Q&A discussion session uh, for about five minutes. Uh, for when we get to that point, we'll unmute everyone. If you're in a quiet, in a in a louder place, you can mute yourself. Uh, just using that icon. If we hear background noise, we can mute you too, um, and then we'll mute you all until the next session. And again, anytime along the way, if you have a question pop in your mind, uh, you can enter it via the questions panel inside your GoToMeeting window. Okay. So uh, just a couple of th slides to get us caught up on where we are. Uh, so in the first webinar, we presented a current reality tree, many of the largest issues that are slowing down product development teams today. We made the point that really all of these problems are interrelated. If we only solve some of them, we're only going to accelerate our projects a little. If we really want to get uh, successful in our product development efforts, we really need to solve all of these problems. On uh, the first three webinars, we really spent most of our time in these areas of the problems on the left. And in this last webinar, this one, we're going to move to this problems on the right, really involving business risk and uh, the impacts of doing uh, better with our business risk. So we also talked in the first webinar about um, some typical economic sensitivities, uh, specifically the cost of delay of an average project being about a half a million dollars a month or $25,000 a day on average. Uh, so this indicates a large opportunity, which lies in focusing a little more on project speed, a little less on project expenses. Again, in the first two webinars, we saw the big benefits of uh, making the queues visible, implementing pull of the resources. This discourages multitasking, reduces the long queue time and the execute time, which extends the duration of all of our tasks. Recognize the key aspect of the pull system and the resource level is shown on, as shown on the right here. Our clear, correct priorities determined in part using the project or milestone priority and the criticality of the task on that project. In the last webinar, we saw how keeping these priorities constantly up to date can really benefit our projects a lot as well. We do this by increasing the sampling rate on our project control system. We do that by decreasing the batch size with which we update tasks and projects data. We basically update uh, more frequently without really increasing the overall work level on the team, and we use the feedback we get to gain more control over our projects. When we finally left off, we made the point that to achieve fast projects, which we have great confidence in, requires really two things. One, a more predictive model of our project, 
and two, more control over the system and the project itself. So in order to achieve these, we require a few things. We listed a number of them here. Good plan, full of the resources, high or at least measured availability to the work, small update batches, correct priorities, things like that. And all these capabilities are enabled and improved by the last principle we discussed, which is decentralized project management. So today we get to the last, but certainly not the least, key to having fast and confident projects. And this is a huge factor in improving the control we have over our projects and how predictive our models are, our plans are. And we've called it simply manage risks up to this point, but now we're going to expand it to show that it's really a lot more. So I'm going to start off by defining what the scope of what we're talking about here, starting at the definition of a project risk. Especially medical device companies, often we're working with medical device companies, we have to make the point that it's, it's not patient risk we're talking about. It's not FMEAs or process FMEAs, but it really is similar. Uh, in the, each, each risk has a probability and a severity, and by deliberately recognizing and mitigating them, that's yeah, probably a good idea. So project risk, generally speaking, is the same as a business risk. Uh, this is because project risk is defined as an uncertain event or condition that if it occurs has either a positive or negative effect on our project objectives. And since our project objectives are business objectives, a project risk is a business risk. So just real quickly, our project objectives in traditional terms are things like scope, schedule, cost, and quality. We like to talk more in economic terms. So we put our project objectives in the terms of schedule or launch date, sales volume, sales price, unit cost, and project expenses. And any of these are impacted, the business is impacted, and that's why we associate project risk with business risk. A couple more points to make about the definition of a risk. First, it includes both negative effects, you know, usually think of as risks or threats, and positive effects, which were referred to as opportunities. Really, you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but it's all just a matter of perspective. If our baseline is the ideal happy path, nothing's going to go wrong position, then almost everything is a risk or threat. But if our baseline is a realistic recognition of the way things usually go, then we have more of a mix of opportunity to improve our performance relative to normal and uh, or risks that can hurt our performance relative to, to what usually happens. So I'll illustrate that a little bit. Uh, before then, I want to just make the point that uh, really there's a, there's a very close correlation between a risk, an issue, and a knowledge gap. And I'm not going to go into any long proof or explanation or anything, but just a couple of points here. Uh, first, you know, what's the difference between a condition and our event that is definitely going to impact our project objectives and one that has, one has maybe a 90% chance of impacting our objectives? So should we not address the one that's only probably going to hurt us? Well, so odds are it's better to address both. And the decision to really address a risk or an issue, even if even an existing one, or a knowledge gap, be proactive or reactive in it, it's all just a function of how much it pays to address it. And the process of addressing these are really largely the same. And so since the pro secondly, if the process is the same, you know, really what good does it do to define, you know, to put these into individual buckets? I don't, I don't find a view value at it. So ultimately, as we mentioned in the last webinar, you know, the product of product development is information and knowledge. Product development is all about the information, generating, translating, and transferring information as quickly as we can. So once we have a good information engine, one that drives our product development car at a high and sustainable speed, we're going to be successful. So it's just a matter of building that engine. Very often, these risks and issues like knowledge gaps all come down to needing to learn something and taking specific actions to learn that information earlier. And a few times we can't think of how to learn earlier, we'll, we'll mitigate the risk or the issue by reducing how much it's going to hurt it if we can't learn it. But usually it starts with learning and trying to learn quickly. So what? Why do we care? Why bother with any of this risk issue stuff? Well, because we all know, right? Better man, we can get better outcomes by managing our project risk. We get better control over our project destiny. And since we suggest that because product development is all about the information, we can improve our destiny by simply being more deliberate about acquiring the information we need. We just build a better information engine when we focus on the information that it generates. 
Okay, so right about now we poll the audience and provide some to provide us some examples of risks that they have in mind. But uh, we'll go ahead and save some time and jump right into three real common ones. You know, three examples here include a case where a product or a feature in our product might not sell as well as we think. Uh, we have a case where some te there are some technological hurdle hurdles and a supply chain risk. So in traditional project risk management, there's an important concept called a risk driver. So these are the specific concerns that we have in the back of our minds, and we really look under the surface of a risk. Now you'll notice here, you know, when we think about it a little bit, usually there's a number of questions, which if we had certainty in the answers of those questions early enough, really we, the, the risk would no longer be a risk. So these are the risk drivers. So we've come to recognize some good benefits to putting our risk drivers in the form of a question. Uh, one, it's a real natural way for people to think, and it gets us and, and two, it gets us started down the road of early learning. How can I quickly answer this question? So once we get into the flow of capturing our risk drivers in the form of a question, it's a pretty natural extension to see there's really not that much difference between a knowledge gap, which we know we need an answer to, and an uncertainty or risk driver, which we probably need an answer to. So, and it, you know, it's not completely required that we put our drivers in the form of a question. It just often works out well. Um, but the point is really to recognize early when some information is needed and find good, fast ways to get that information. And certainly the earlier we get that information, the better, because as we discussed in the last webinar, the later we receive some information, the less valuable it is. So we'll get into more about how to answer these questions quickly here a little later in the webinar. I just want to set the stage for understanding what we're talking about when we say risk generically for the rest of the webinar. Again, even in the case of the issues and even in the case of opportunities, by deliberately determining what we need to learn, what we need to do, and then doing it and learning it quickly, we can improve our outcome. By burying our heads in the sand, on the other hand, crossing our fingers, hoping for the best, expecting the best possible scenario regardless of how unlikely it is, things probably aren't going to work out that well. So before we get into how to do this, let's take a step back a little bit to see really how much, how much can we improve our outcomes by doing this. What's the real value of deliberately managing our learning? So we have a little analogy we like to use when describing the situation we're in. Uh, projects are like the road we have to travel to get to the finish line. The finish line, however, is not in a fixed location, and we have control over where that ends up. And in general, we never really know exactly where the finish line is until we get there. You know, the fundamental question is really what, what is the probability of the finish line being where you think it is? And typically, it's further away than we think. So where the finish line actually ends up depends on a number of factors. You know, first there's the amount of actual work that the critical resources need to execute. Second is the amount of availability those cre those critical resources have during the time that they're critical. And then there's the wait time associated with procurements or whatever that can't be filled up with critical work, which is really usually pretty small, especially when you're managing risks well. And lastly, you know, there's all of the unmitigated and unforeseen risks that end up blowing up in our face and creating more work and more wait time. So these unmitigated risks and knowledge gaps that are recognized or filled too late are like little mines on the road ahead. Some are duds, most are not. Uh, when they explode, which can happen when we get there or before we get there, they move the finish line further away, or so it seems. In reality, the finish line was already there in the first place because the risks were already there in the first place, and each one of them has a probability of occurring. You know, there, once there are enough of them, some of them are bound to go off, and our finish line was never really here to begin with. So, for example, we have 10 risks, each with a 10% probability of occurrence. You know, odds are one of them is going to occur. And to expect none of them to occur, expect our finish line to be here, despite the fact that there's 100 risks in front of us, really isn't realistic. Where there are risks, there are going to be problems, and really, where there are risks, there already are problems until those risks are mitigated. So the likelihood of one of these mines blowing up in our face, blowing up our project schedule, uh, multiplied by the size of the explosion or the risk impact, and that's what we call the risk exposure. And the exposure across all of our risks really determines where our finish line really is. So this includes both the risks we recognize before we get there and the ones we don't. And of course, recognize them as the first step to diffusing them or putting a bomb shelter around it to keep it from causing so much damage. So 
uh, our option is to take deliberate action or not. We can take deliberate action and mitigate the risk and effectively bring the line, finish line closer to us relative to where it would be if we didn't take that action, or we can hope for the best. And generally, each mitigation does a lot to pull our finish line closer. We have a lot of leverage over where the finish line actually is, especially when we know how to use quick learning to quickly diffuse these bonds. So just a quick illustration here to how much leverage we have. We'll use an example here of a high risk on a six-month project that has an exposure of four weeks. Uh, risks you know, often exist in parallel. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is an example that illustrates a single risk in series where if this one risk is realized, we suffer the entire impact. So for example, you know, our parts are all simple, easy to get except for one, and this one part is almost sure to be critical when it's time to get those parts for verification build or launch. And the delay in that part is going to be a delay in the project day for day. And every day earlier that we can receive that part, good parts, is one day earlier that we're going to be complete. So in this case, in this example, there's a challenge in the manufacturing of that part. There's a 50-50 chance of we're going to have some problems when we get to early production runs. And delay could be up to eight weeks. Pretty complicated parts. We're probably going to ruin all of our stock. And by the time we find the part, find the problem, figure out how to fix it, fix it and get new parts, you know, probably an eight-week impact. 50-50 chance of an eight-week impact represents four weeks of exposure. And so we treat it like a four-week risk. And we estimated it would take about a week for the critical resource to analyze, plan, mitigate the risk. We could develop and test alternate solutions, which are easy to produce. We're about producing and testing some throwaway versions of those parts. And just to get the working, the, the manufacturing issues all worked out early before they can become critical and cost us time on the project. That leaves us two options. Option one is to not mitigate the risk. We keep critical resources just working on the critical chain. There's only 50-50% chance of this problem. We're going to take our chances. So that moves us one week closer to the finish line. It is probably over here. You know, doing one week of work on the critical chain appears to move us one week closer to the end. And really the ROI of that one week of work is one to one. We get one week closer to the end with one week of work. Now the other option is we can mitigate the risk, which takes one week of the critical resources time and would delay our critical chain one week and therefore extend the project one week, except the fact that we mitigate the risk, which pulls the finish line four weeks closer to us. You know, the net result is that we get three weeks earlier done with completion on our project, and the ROI on that one week of work is three to one. We get three weeks earlier three weeks closer to the finish line with uh, one week of work. So one quick question, you know, how much more time could we have spent working on this risk before it would have been wasted time and we would have been better off working on the critical chain instead of working on the risk? Let's think about that for a second. And really the answer is really we could we could keep, we could make this another three weeks longer, and the finish line would go to where the finish line probably was in the first place. And it really is so it, we don't start losing money until after another maybe full four weeks of risk mitigation. And really, when we're on the critical chain, you know, there's if we can reduce exposure one day with one day of work, we're breaking even. We're really more than breaking even because we're getting certainty in where that finish line is, and that's got value in itself, just knowing where it is and having the potential variance on where the finish is going to end up not be so big. All right, so of course there's generally a lot more than a single risk on a project and because of the many risks involved, you know, really there's a probability distribution for, for when the project's going to get done. Are we going to choose to accept this wide range of possibilities or we can mitigate our risk to narrow the range and bring the probable finish line earlier? You know, at the very least, even if we don't do anything to move it, by recognizing the risks, we're getting a better idea for where the completion date probably is, instead of you know imagining it's there at that mirage you know, in the close in the in the near future. We see that it really is really out in the far distant future. Um, you know, problem is, of course, if we don't do this assessment, we don't look at our risks, and we're generally optimistic beings. We're going to think 
things are going to go well for us, despite the realities of the past and the real uncertainties of today. You know, we're going to think things are going to go better than they actually will. There's a, you know, and there's a lot that, that pushes us to that. Even when we want to be realistic, you know, we're often prodded by the peers or managers to take the more off the best view. Nobody wants to be the downer, the guy who has to point out the real odds of it not going so well. And there are lots of times we go hand a good realistic uh, project to our manager, and they come back and ask us to really make it unrealistically shorter. So the result is too often we end up building a happy path for our schedule, the one where nothing is ever going to go wrong. We expect or plan the finish date to be as early as possible point, despite the fact that it's really almost impossible to reach it because of all the risks that are involved. There are so many risks, many uncertainties, and some of, those are, some of them are going to hurt us. Some of them are going to move that project past where we'd like it to be, especially if we don't see them and do something about it. So our choice is to either recognize the risk or we're going to be later than we expect with our projects. Uh, and our second choice is to do something about them or we're going to be later than we have to be. Okay, so without risk management, our projects end up looking like this. Lots of little fires to fight and very little certainty in our completion date. You know, those orange lines you're looking at here are the, the risks materializing and turning into little fires we have to put out or the information being found out too late and are costing our project time. The red ones there are on the critical chain. The blue ones are not. So in this view, we mitigate the risks by adding little green lines, you know, little work in the green lines. And in the process of the green lines, we take out the orange lines or make them much smaller. And we can't take out all of them, but we can take out a lot of them. And the result is we get some empty space. And once we uh, recover that empty space, we move the, the project back to eliminate the empty space. We get a much earlier finish date with much more certainty in that finish date. Uh, so one quick comment here. So about risks in parallel versus risks in series. You know, this picture indicates you know, there are a lot of risks in parallel. One of these orange lines occurs. It buys us room and space for the other line, other orange risks to materialize and have those not cost us so much as they would. They're just all on their own. So you know, a lot of times people recognize that at the back of their head. They say, well, doesn't that dilute you know, the, the effort that I should put into mitigating that risk? If, you know, if I've got 10 risks and they're all in parallel and they're all two-week risks, then each risk really a, a one-day risk. And the answer there is, well, yes, except for the fact that our mitigations are often in parallel, too. Once we add a little green line to mitigate one risk, that gives us some space and some room to mitigate other risks, too. And so, you know, it makes the value, the, mid, the, the cost of the mitigation average out, too, to be much less than the cost of any one mitigation. So ultimately, we can generally look at a single risk, look at the, what it costs us on that one risk, what it costs us if we don't do that run risk, and decide what to do just based on a risk-by-risk -risk basis. By doing that, we get much earlier completion dates, more certainty in that completion dates, and really both of those are really valuable and can pay for a lot of risk mitigation. So that said, you know, not all risks really are necessarily should be mitigated. Some risks are going to cost us more than they pay us to mitigate. So logic here, help us decide whether to mitigate a risk is fairly simple. You know, if the cost now to mitigate the risk is less than the cost later, times the probability of that cost later, it's worth the cost now. You know, the cost now is the cost of the mitigation. Cost later is the impact and uh, the probability, which is our risk exposure. So a hypothetical situation, pose a question to you here. So you just inherited a million dollars from your long last debt. She happened to be a realtor, and she stipulated in her will that you have to buy a house with that money, that million dollars. So you're not taking out a loan. No one's making you. Do you still shell out the $500 for an inspector to come over give, your, give the house that you like a good look over? Now, we ask this in a, in a room full of people. Most people say absolutely yes. Because somewhere in the back of our minds, we run this little calculation that told us this, the potential costs of a million-dollar house times the probability of those costs. It's going to far out, far exceed $500. So, you know, this this question illustr or this example illustrates, you know, the fact that there are really multiple costs now, oftentimes, and sometimes, and multiple costs later, 
And the formula is really the sum of the costs now against the sum of the costs later and the individual probabilities of each of those costs later. And we do this in the back of our minds every day, you know, whether we realize it or not. It's how we decide to get out of bed in the morning and drive to work despite the risks. So we all have essentially the same question, equation in the back of our minds. It's really the only differences of opinion on whether a risk could be mitigated or not are purely a function of the differences of opinion about the factors in this equation. So especially in cases on the bubble, in our, you know, in our minds, maybe not worth it. And we recommend bringing this, this little formula up to the front of our minds and at least talking about what the different terms are and trying to come to you know, consensus on uh, what we should do about it. So, uh, and oftentimes when we run these numbers, what we often find is that most companies don't do nearly enough risk mitigation. You know, we often find that even the low risks that a lot of people think aren't worth the time to mitigate really are worth the time to mitigate. And to make matters worse, it seems like the less time we have, the more risks we think we should take. You know, our project due date, if our project due date doesn't give us time to mitigate our risks, for some reason we think we're better off just not mitigating them. You know, so I've got another analogy here. Say we're in Vegas and we're down to our last $20 and we're going to bet it all on one hand of blackjack. You know, does it somehow increase our chances of winning because we only have $20 left? No. It doesn't matter. The cards don't care how much money we do or don't have in our pocket. And these risks are not magically going to disappear because our due date is coming up fast. You know, the simple fact is if we have 10 risks with 10% probability of occurring, one of them is likely to occur if we don't do anything to prevent them. And you know, there's a good chance more of them will. And if we can mitigate all of them in less time than the exposure of any one of them, it pays to do it, especially if we're low on time. You know, Simply just a matter of trading off the cost now against the probability modified cost later and choosing the right thing to do. Okay, so a couple more things. Uh, the cost now usually takes the form of project expenses and sometimes a plan to lay of the project for critical resources, the one working on the risk. Sometimes we'll mitigate a risk by accepting higher COGS or lower sales, but those are pretty rare. So we'll focus on the cost of the risks and it being expenses and delays. Uh, the cost later, however, can be an expenses, it can be delay as well, but can also commonly be in the form of reduced sales volume, sales price, or increased cost. You know, if we're low on time early, we've got a due date raising up fast, sometimes we can save time by taking risks to our volume and our sales price and our COGS just to meet that due date. Sometimes we take our risk on quality, which is directly or indirectly impacting our sales volumes and price, not only on this product, but on other products as well. You know, and these risks may not be worth taking either just for the sake of a due date. You know, we're going to race to that due date with a project that doesn't sell well. We incorporate these other potential costs, you know, little expense and delay early can easily pay for itself. Okay, but the fact is most of our risks are scheduled delay risks anyway. Most of the time the cost now is a scheduled delayed cost and what we're doing is betting with a little time now that we're going to save more time later. We're betting we can spend a few days early to eliminate a few weeks later in the project. And when this is the case, when we're taking a schedule impacting risk, it makes no sense to take more risks when we have less time. It's just going to make things work. We're bound to finish our project long after the due date instead of a little bit after the due date. It's really, ultimately, it's better to finish as early as possible with a high selling product that doesn't cost us much to make. And we achieve this by only taking the risks we can't find time and cost of ways, effective ways of mitigating that don't, uh, where, the, where the, the cost here is greater than the cost there. Okay, very much because by mitigating risk, we're really, we're learning deliberately and we're learning and generating information earlier when it's more valuable. You know, whether that information is a, we call it a knowledge gap or a risk driver, or just one of the thousands of questions we have to answer over the course of a product development project, and the earlier we gain that answer, the more valuable it's going to be. So the, the amount of information we have to generate on a project is high, but it's not infinite. You know, the number of questions there are to answer really pales in comparison to all the number of answers, you know, all the specifications that come from those answers. And we spend many hours documenting, and reviewing all of the answers. But we suggest that we add a little bit of time to identify the right questions, make those questions visible, manage the learning that we can do, and we'll learn earlier generate more value in the form of faster projects, better products, and completion dates we have confidence in. OK, 
Okay, so here we show a risk burn down chart. And this is a, one that indicates a really healthy risk management process. We're gonna, not going to go into a whole scoring system right now. We will maybe if we have time later. But you can probably imagine how it works. High risks are given more points than a medium risk, which are given more points than a low risk. And we chart these points over time. You know, burn down that looks like this is critical you know, to fast and confident projects. If we don't burn risk and we're floating out in here with high risk still, we aren't going to get done in time no matter what our schedule says. So, you know, burn down that looks like this is how we get confident projects, fast, confident projects. Um, so one where we don't have any high risks left by the middle of the project. We've burned them all to become medium risks. And we burned a bunch of medium risks in the process as well. So ultimately, you know, we're striving for this kind of thing. We want to maximize our uncertainty burn rate. We want to maximize the slope on this curve. And by maximizing the slope on this curve, we reach zero earlier. And when we reach zero, we're at the end of our project and we're done. Ultimately, whatever we can do to maximize the uncertainty burn rates can help us complete our projects more quickly. So we've got to focus on that slope and how do we make a nice steep slope there. So you'll notice uh, the green, yellow, red areas, they don't conform to this slope. We're not bending the slope down. This slope, you know, this kind of curve is something that we strive for, that we work toward, you know, we practice to achieve. This kind of a more of a linear approach is something uh, we can shoot for really in our first entree into project risk management, learning management. And so you know, because that's really where we start, that's what we uh, have shown here. Okay. A really continuously improving product development in very many ways is continuously making this a steeper and steeper slope. And it's all about how do we do that. Okay, so we really, we really improve our burn down rate. We make that slope, slope a lot steeper, We're doing two things, continuously doing these things better. And we're going to talk about those next. But first, uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, so let's see, do we have any questions so far? I'm going to go ahead and open the mics up in case any of them ha anybody has one now. And uh, we have a lot to talk about. So um, if we don't have many, we'll just keep trucking. Anybody have a question or comment? Or? Yeah, well, that comment still. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I think that was uh, a real question or something. If, it, if, you, if you had a question, um, please go ahead and just type it into your questions box. Um, we're going to go ahead and keep going. We'll get probably some more questions by the time we get to the end, so we'll save our question time for later. Okay. So two things we can do to make our burn down curves really, really steep. First, we start the highest value in learning earlier. Basically, we figure out what our priorities are. You know, what do we focus on first? What do we focus on next? What do we focus on after that? And we prioritize our learning and our risk integrations as correctly as we can. Secondly, once we get started on the right learning, we must know how to complete it quickly, very fast. So we're going to talk about both of these. Uh, first, we talk about highest value learning earlier. Basically, we maximize the slope of our burn down curve by trying to maximize the burn down ROI. Burn down ROI is the amount of risk reduction or risk burn, the how much we drop the curve, divided by how much we spend on that mitigation. And of course, that mitigation cost being delay and expenses. Now, of course, we don't calculate this every time. We just use it to help guide our decisions on priorities and when to mitigate a risk. What this means is generally we focus on the highest risk first. So by a high, focusing on the highest risk first, we go try to accomplish a high risk burn factor. And that's why we focus on those first. There's a lot of risk to burn in those areas. But the other way we can do this is to reduce the mitigation cost. You know, we can reduce the mitigation cost to almost nothing. And the ROI can be really big, even if the risk is pretty small, even if the risk burn is pretty small. And that's a lot about what we're talking about. So um, 
one way to do this is to you know recognize that mitigation cost really has two factors. It's delay and expenses. And if there's no delay in the mitigation and the expenses aren't very high, the mitigation cost is almost nothing and the ROI is large, even if the risk burn is small. So for example, one of our resources isn't critical. He's not critical early in the project. And you can go eliminate a low risk somewhere with a couple of days of analysis or test before he goes off and orders some parts that just sit on the shelf waiting for other parts to come in anyway. The mitigation costs very little. The ROI is very high. You know, later, he, maybe he's critical, and the mitigation is going to cause a delay to our schedule. Now, of course, if there were other risks to mitigate, something else to work on that's going to deliver a higher ROI, our resource should work on that instead. You know, if there's some four-week risk we can burn down in four days you know, and achieve a risk ROI burn rate of one week of risk burn per day of mitigation cost, we get a higher ROI than burning a one-week risk in two days, which should give us one week per two days. So we basically we choose the right thing by focusing on the risk that delivers the highest burn down ROI at any given time. And once we choose the right priorities, then it's a matter of minimizing our mitigation costs by learning fast wherever we can. So how do we do that? So there are many, many, many ways to reduce the cost of our mitigations and to learn faster. And this is one of the major themes. Toyota Lean, Agile, Don Reinertson's Next Generation Lean. Everybody has uh, something to say about how to learn faster. So we're going to discuss a few of these opportunities, but the world's full of them, and really we're continuously inventing more. And, re and this is the fun of product development, really. You know, finding ways to, to learn faster this is really a lot of fun. And really building our ability to continuously learn faster is how we drive that risk burn curve to be steeper and steeper. So let's talk about a few ways to learn faster. One, absolutely the most important way we can learn faster is by mitigating, making the mitigations cost less by not batching them up together with other mitigations and creating those unnecessarily and costly delays in the process. So we saw that in the last webinar all about the batch size where we saw how we create really large delays, especially in our feedback loops, by batching things up. And we do the same thing in our learning and it costs us a lot. So for example, our engineer that could run the two-day test to mitigate some low risk, to answer some question early, we could have waited. He could have batched that up and run that test along with all the other tests when he got the next round of parts. But that would be delaying that learning and that information for weeks. And information later is worth less, worth a lot less. So if he can find the problem earlier, say he runs his little two-day test, he finds a problem, he thinks of a solution, and he needs to get those parts on order. So he puts that solution in that next round of parts. And he gets to test that solution one iteration more. If we'd have put off that test and we'd have to find that solution later and add it to the stack of changes we'd have later for that part, you know, that's just adding to a, a, an ever increasing size stack of changes we have to make. And the more changes, the more information we leave for later design iterations, the more iterations we're going to need and the longer our projects are going to take. So there's an analogy I, I use. Oops. There we go. Here's an analogy I like to use in describing the design, build, test batches and the large batches versus smaller ones. So my analogy, our resources, represented by this little fellow here, have to pick up some requirements out of this pile and run them around the track and drop them in the bank at the end. Now in most cases, those requirements come with some risks indicated by the question marks. Now, we get to remove one question mark on each boulder we carry to the end at the end of each loop. And we have to keep carrying that boulders around the loop until we eliminate all of those question marks. Then we can deposit that money in the bank. And you'll notice here we have a little sledgehammer we could use at our disposal to break up these big boulders into smaller chunks and separate out the questions. And really have a decision make. We can carry large and heavy loads and walk slowly around the track carrying big boulders. Or we can break up those boulders and carry light loads and run very quickly around the track. Now, the, the speed to weight ratio is nonlinear here in this situation, too. We add a little bit more weight. Very often, it slows us down a lot. So as many have said, and I'll echo that, you know, we learn when we get to the test. That's why the bank is at the test. You know, we're most, uh, most often generating value inf valuable information, valuable knowledge when we get to that test. And, and many, including us, have proposed that, well, the better approach is to not design at all, just go straight to the test. You know, the test first strategy here called. 
then we design later after we've done some testing. I totally agree. That is kind of what it looks like, but I, I also believe we can't really just jump straight to the test to get good information and, and the answers to the important questions. Really, to answer the questions we need quickly, well, first we have to understand what the questions are we're trying to answer, and we want to think a little bit of how we're, how we're going to answer them, what we have to set up the test to get us that information. You know, so all of those thoughts about the test, what questions, how are we going to test it, that's all a little bit of design. You know, we have to build a little mock-up or uh, travel to somewhere to, to ask some people some questions. That's a little part of build. You know, you can't just jump off and straight to the test. So we can't really necessarily just skip straight to the test. We just break out a few questions and carry a very light load and run very quickly through design and build on our way to the test. You know, seeing that we're just simply shrinking our design build test batch sizes and accelerating our learning in the process. The more we can do this, the better. We may run a few more laps, but we run them a lot faster and we win the race to complete that pile of work earlier. Now that said, you know, you see this little black conveyor belt over here. So this is a black conveyor belt is our procure step, which we put into the build uh, loop, build part of this cycle. You know, and that procure step, it delays our learning. We don't get to the test because of this long procure cycle we often have. You know, sometimes that procure cycle is necessary. Sometimes there's nothing we can do about it. But sometimes there is. And when there is, often it, it really pays us back. And one of the keys to success is finding ways to get the test without going through a long build, you know, design and build cycle. So here's an example. What if our, one of our requirements on our new product is don't make it too big? So we weren't really sure what that meant. We didn't know what too big was. You know, how could we find that out? So do we need to go design and build a prototype and carry that around and show the customers? Yeah, maybe eventually that will give us a little more information, but we could start out by asking the customer really empty-handed, uh, can you show me something, an example of something that you would consider not too big? Or are we carrying there some cardboard boxes or some foam, blue foam that we cut up? You know, something we had in the shop could get our hands on very easily you know, to get the answer to those questions. So really, that's just one of a million examples. And the room for improvement from debatching and finding those ways is enormous. And there's a lot we can learn with very little design and procurement and build time. And product development success is very much about finding innovative ways to do that. So debatching our build test loops, I mean, that's huge. It's by far the biggest way to learn faster. And there's, you know, I could go on for hours about that. But we'll move on to a couple other ways. Um, so here now we're looking at a graph which shows us how much information we generate in a test as a function of how likely the outcome was in the first place. So for example, let's say I ran a test where I was almost positive it was passed, you know, almost zero probability of failure on this one, and lo and behold it passes. How much did I learn? Yeah, I didn't learn much. So if, it, if I was pretty sure it was going to fail and it fails, how much did I learn? nothing, pretty much didn't learn much there either. So you, know, you can't really maximize the learning by maximizing the success rates of an experiment. And because product development is all really all about how quickly we can learn, building tests we ultimately expect to pass gets us very slowly to the end. Ultimately, we learn the most from a single test we target a 50% failure rate. So for example, let's say I have a board and I found there's some problem in the circuit between components A, B, C, and D. Somewhere in this chain of uh, components, there's a problem. And I need to figure out where the problem is. Now, if the problem stands an equal chance of being in each component, we can test the pot between any two components in the same amount of time. We're going to eliminate half of the possibilities by testing between B and C first. There's a 50% chance of failure of that test. We'll know exactly where the problem is in two tests. We'll eliminate find it's over on this half, and run it again, and we find it's in one of these two, two components. If we decided to test between A and B first, or between C and D, we're probably only eliminating 25% of the possibilities. There's a decent chance we're going to have to test three times to really find the problem component. Turns out there's a 25% there's a chance it'll take one try, a 25% chance it's going to take two tries, and a 50% chance it'll take three tries if we start at the end here. You know, work out over time that eliminating 50% chunks will get us to the answer faster when we can test these 50% chunks in an equal amount of time. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. So 
So here's another example, more of a real life scenario. You know, we're developing a bicycle component. It has to be strong enough and as light as possible. Our specification is 200 pounds of load or greater, and we estimate it's going to break you know, somewhere between 200 and 400 pounds. And maybe a 10% probability of it breaking under 200 pounds, 10% probability of it lasting past 400. And, but we don't really know until we test it. Speed test, so we can't just ramp it up and know exactly where it's going to break in one test. We have to try a load, cycle it 10,000 cycles, and see if it breaks or not. So we have a fixture that we can do 10,000 cycles in an hour. So looking at this picture, you know, how much information do we generate? If we test it 200 pounds, we think it's going to break out here, and lo and behold, we tested 200 pounds and it didn't break. How many of the possibilities did we eliminate? How much of the information did we gain? We gained 10%. We eliminated this much. That's 10% of the information that we got with that test. Now, if we limit, test it at 300 pounds and the part doesn't break, and we know the failure is out here somewhere, we eliminate 50% of the possibilities. We do that a lot faster. Now, if we tested at 200 pounds and it broke, and so the failure was really out here, we eliminated 90% of the possibilities oops, and got to that answer you know, of 90% very quickly. But the odds were low that that was going to give us that answer. So how many iterations does it take to get to find out that this breaks at about 250 pounds? So we do one at 300 pounds, find out it doesn't break, or it breaks. Do one at 200 pounds, find out it doesn't break. Do one at 250, maybe it breaks, maybe it doesn't. And uh, we do one at 225 or one at 275, and we get our answer. You know, four iterations, four hours with the testing, we get 100% of the information. We know exactly where it's going to break as opposed to you know, just testing to the spec, just testing to two, you know, 200 pounds. Did it pass the spec? Yes or no? We get 10% of the information in one hour, or we could get 100% of the information in four hours. Ultimately, we burn more risk in less time. We get a greater risk ROI by doing 100% in four hours versus 10% in one hour. And that's what we're striving for. And the value we gain from 100% of the information, knowing exactly where the part's going to break, is big. You know, by not making it too weak, we improve sales, you know, eliminate some returns, good value in that. By not making it too strong, too heavy, we improve our COGS, we improve the sales because our, our product is lighter, performance is better. You know, the value of the information of, of knowing exactly where the right answer is, is big. And the cost to generate it is small, and we maximize our risk burn ROI by doing that. So you know, as I said, we don't always get the exact fastest burn rate by targeting a 50% failure, because we can't always burn. We, we can often burn smaller chunks a lot more quickly than we can burn a 50% chunk. So for example, back to our circuit, you know, let's say we, had, we could test whether it's in component A, we could test between A and B in 10 minutes. And we could, both, could test between C and D in 20 minutes. And it would take us a couple of days to go get the equipment and figure out the baseline and, and be able to test between B and C for some reason. So how do we burn risk most quickly in that? And what's the steepest risk burn option in that case? Well, we start out spending 10 minutes to eliminate the 25% probability of today. If that doesn't give us the answer, we spend the next 20 minutes eliminating this 25% probability it's in D. And if that still doesn't give us the answer, at least we've, we know it's in here and, it, we, and it's worth spending the time it takes to get to figure out whether it's in B or C. So the whole point there being, you know, a lot of a lot of cases, you know, we're looking for the quick answer. We're looking for a, a little bit of information in a lot less time. And when we can get a little bit of information in a lot less time, it's going to pay us back. There's a hard, huge ROI on that. Okay. So, but really, it's all about maximizing our risk burn rate. Sometimes it's a 50% failure rate, sometimes it's not. Um, and really, if we can just mock up and test something really quickly, it often pays to do it, even if we're only going to get a little information. It really comes down to spending a little cost now to avoid a bigger cost later, and minimizing the cost now relative to that cost later. Uh, so doing OK on time. We're a little bit behind, but I think we're, all, we're fine. So um, this brings me to the topic of set-based engineering, set-based design, 
Now this is a method usually associated with Toyota product development system, though it appears in other places outside of Toyota. The typical description is where we develop for the multiple solutions in parallel with the ultimate goal of finding one that's going to work. You know, that description really sells it short. You know, too often it really seems like a simple risk mitigation. You know, we mitigate the risk of one solution not working by developing alternate solutions instead. So for example, we had one solution with a 50% chance of working. We had a second solution. If it has a 50% chance of working too, we reduce the risk by 25%. You know, we're down to a 25% probability we still don't have a solution. If we had a third option, we reduce it another 12%. If we had a fourth option, we reduce it another 6%. And each option we can develop, which mitigates the risk enough to pay for that option, is a good idea. So you know, it seems like a few options carried out in our risk areas makes good sense, especially when there's a procurement time on option one, during which we, time we can develop option two, just in case the option one doesn't work. But if there isn't much procurement time, you know, we can just test option one early, and if it doesn't work, then we move on to option two. But if it does, then we just have option one, and we go with it, right? Seems like a good plan. But so the problem with this, and really where the true power of set-based engineering comes from, is the idea that if we tested option one, even if it seems good, there's often still some risk that it isn't. You know, maybe our load condition specifications were wrong. Maybe the test didn't reveal some issue that's there even under those conditions. We just didn't find that in our test. So whenever we discover that the design has to change, do we have to scramble to get the information we need to fix it then? Or do we already have that information in our back pocket because we did some set of phase development earlier in the process? You know, the solution to that problem besides the solution to that problem in the future isn't necessarily switched to the other option either. Sometimes none of the options we tested are the right solution. But a set-based development provides, can provide us a good picture of the whole range of possible solutions, which can help us find new solutions between the solutions we tested. You know, so basically what we're talking about here is, is rather than just test one design, one material, one normal load condition, we test a number of designs, a number of materials, a number of load conditions to understand earlier the whole range of potential solutions. So if we need to change later, we've gotten our, you know, a good likely answer right in our back pocket. And once we have a complete you know, picture of this potential solution, every time that picture comes in handy, it pays us back a little. It, it gives us a little bit more on our risk burn in the numerator of our ROI equation. And this picture really can come in handy a lot, especially in risky areas on this project, but also when we're going to use this information in future projects. Every time we use this information, we have a little bit more risk burn to the numerator of that ROI equation. Really, it's all about having a complete picture of the information for fast future use. It's about having faster feedback, answers before we even have the question, and reducing all of the future work and delay associated with getting answers. So that's learning early. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's one more big thing to talk about when it comes to minimizing risk and completing our projects earlier. And that's improving our ability to easily incorporate the information we receive. Either, you know, even if we receive it a little later than we'd like, it comes down to how well our architecture enables us or prevents changes to incorporate new information. So architecture uh, refers to the pieces of the product and how we choose to separate the parts and then interface them back together again to produce a working product. So for example, a product which has a power board and a control board, do we put both of those functions on the same board or do we keep them on separate boards with a cable in between. Now, our architecture determines very much determines the fundamental economics of our product. You know, it does this because our architecture impacts all of our economic objectives on the project. It impacts our COGS, sales volume, sales price, and the schedule and the expense that it takes to develop this product. So I'm just going to cut to the chase on this one. You know, it's really just a matter of modularity and choosing where to modularize and where not to and the impacts of doing this in the right places. So let's quickly uh, define what we mean by modularity, uh, which I like to define by using its opposite, which is tight integration. So in a tightly integrated product, changes have a ripple effect, more of a ripple effect across the design and across into multiple components. In a modular architecture, we can change things without those ripple effects going as far and having as large of an impact. And this can come in handy in very specific places namely our high-risk areas. 
in our high risk areas, we have to iterate more. And very often, we're going to have to change something even late in development. And separating those parts, modularizing in those risky areas so that those changes don't have a big ripple effect to the entire design is a huge risk mitigation and can really accelerate our projects. So in our power board, control board example, you know, what if we had to change the control board seven times over the course of a project? And every time we had to do that, we had to buy and assemble all the power board components along with the latest control board component. Any problem in the power board slows our progress on the control board and vice versa. You know, they just can't simply go as fast through the process if they're bashed together into a single board as opposed to debashed into separate boards. So, you know, you can see here modularity enables us to debatch our design build test loops. We can do six or eight iterations on the risky items, only need to do two or three iterations on the not so risky items. Our high risk areas we really have a lot, you know, we have to change often, we have to change late, and a little while modularity can go a long way to get us on earlier. The modularity also helps in other areas, you know, it allows us to um, spread the work across more people, you know, use more resources without in, in parallel without ha that having to talk all the time about how uh, what changes they're making that are impacting each other. And you know, but like we said, you know, nothing nothing is free. So if we modularize and we get a faster schedule for the same or maybe lower expenses, maybe sometimes we have to give up a little bit on COGS or we have to give up a little bit on product performance. You know, modularizing oftentimes means giving margin at our interfaces or putting in some parts here to separate this side from that side. You know, it's more parts, oftentimes makes our product heavier, sometimes makes it bigger. You know, maybe it's a little heavier, maybe it's a little bigger, but we got done a lot faster. And that's the point. Find places where we can give up a little bit maybe on COGS or a little bit maybe on product performance, uh, but we get done a lot earlier and overall we make a lot more money that way if our cost of delay is high. It may take some work, but uh, once we understand the pros and cons, it's definitely worth it. Okay, so we don't really have time for what we do to help this out in playbook. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just wrap up and leave ourselves a couple of questions for, or a couple of minutes for questions. Um, point here being deliberately managing our learning is going to get us faster projects with higher confidence knowledge gaps, risk drivers, call them what you will. Deliberately managing them to closure is how we get done faster, one of the big ways. Secondly, you know, we maximize our risk burn down rate by um, starting on the right risks. But, well, so certainly we max when we maximize our risk burn down rate, that's when we minimize our project durations and have maximum confidence. And we do that really by starting on the right tasks, working on them in the right order, and learning quickly on each one. Okay, so uh, do we have any questions here? Let's see. David? Someone had uh, typed in a question about an example for uh, modularity, but they typed it in before you gave that example. But maybe oh, okay. I thought of a, uh, a great example that a uh, customer gave at a lean conference that we hosted one time. They they had they make uh, video systems for arthroscopic surgery, and they came out with some new technology. So um, rather than design the whole board, they used um, they split it into two boards. They put all of the functionality that wasn't going to change on one, and then fast rapidly iterated with this smaller littler board that they plugged into it. When they got done and they got it working, rather than taking the time to combine it back into one board, they just sold it with the two boards connected together um, like that. But that, because of their economic sensitivities, getting that done early allowed them to get to a trade show, which was worth a lot more than taking that additional cost out afterward. All right. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump to our poll while we still have a few seconds left. Thank you, everybody, again, for joining our webinars. Hope you got a lot of good benefit out of them. Please 
uh, send us questions anytime. We'd be happy to talk to you about this stuff. So, like talking about this stuff. So. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just launched a poll. If you guys could please answer it, we'd really appreciate it. Um, also, we'll send an email out um, either later today or early tomorrow morning with the recording of the webinar. And thanks so much for attending these four sessions. We really appreciate it. Hope you got a lot out of it.